Elder Race Part 9 Reaper's Dance Carlos. Fifty-seven days after Androm's folly. Human containment facility. Ildor, Andorra's second moon. Alarms blared, their screeching jerked Carlos and Adam out of the tense aftermath of Adam's explanation of the bad things, and his sudden turn to violence. As the wails echoed around them, Carlos kept his eyes on Adam, refusing to look away for even a second. Something in him told him that looking away was a very bad idea, like turning your back on a wild dog. And Adam was definitely wild. There was a madness about him that Carlos had never really seen before. Of course, Carlos had noticed Adam's bumbling insanity, but had chalked it down to pure, harmless dottery. This was different. The edges about Adam were frayed and torn, as if revealing his past to Carlos had irreparably damaged his ability to maintain his peaceful facade, no matter how much he craved its survival. As they both already knew, peace was a temporary thing for creatures like Adam and Carlos. Why do they scream wail? What's the problem? Adam snarled between panted breaths. Carlos got to his feet, his face purposefully neutral. I don't know, Adam. I'll go ask Vildasi, see. She'll know. Adam went over to the impact-proof glass that protected the observation deck from any humans that decided to go homicidally insane. Many Xenos on this side of the AMZ probably thought that this was a real threat, Carlos realized. And when he thought of all the things that humanity had put them through, he didn't blame them. Vildasi! Adam called out, tapping on the glass. Why are the alarms a wailing? Vildasi ignored him. Carlos could see her tapping away feverishly at her computer. He also noticed the door leading to the general prison facility from the observation deck suddenly slammed shut and secured itself. Something was wrong, very wrong. Vildasi was turning this place into a fortress. That meant that one of two things was happening. That humanity had broken through the AMZI and was liberating the facility, or that the other prisoners had staged a revolt. Neither option was appealing. Now that he had some idea of what the human regime was capable of, there were too many unknowns. He had been completely isolated within both his and Adam's enclosures. Carlos had no idea about the layout of the potential battlefield, enemy numbers, or troop quality. Furthermore, if whatever was happening out there started happening inside his enclosure, he'd be damn well trapped with it. No, Carlos did not like this one bit. And it was a testament to his upbringing that his first thought was the potential for violent threats to his own person, and not any other sort of natural disaster like fire, earthquake, or flood. In this case, Carlos was correct. But he was not to know that yet. No. Right now Carlos was doomed to run through simulations of potential situations in his head, all with little or no information, and all of which seemed to end in his grisly demise. He did not know much, but he did know one thing deep down. His moment of peace was over. Vildasi Konkori. Fifty-seven days after Androm's folly. Human containment facility, observation deck. Ildor, Andorra's second moon. Oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no. Oh great sky lord, no. Vildasi couldn't believe her ears as the lockdown siren started to wail. Inside the enclosure, both Adam and Carlos had stopped whatever tense conversation that they'd been having and were now staring at her through the glass. Adam had walked over and was tapping away at it, calling her name all the while. There was a fury about him that Vildasi could remember from his fight against the Tanari pirates. Looking past him, Vildasi could see a coldness spread across Carlos' face. He was already evaluating his position, and she knew that he would decide that it would not do to be in there. He had no information about the state-of-the-art security systems that could turn each individual yard into a fortress. To him, this whole lockdown must look like a trap. She had to keep them both inside this chamber for as long as possible. General information messages chimed in over her personal communicator notifying all non-security personnel to barricade their workplace, whilst the guards got everything under control. The messages didn't really go into detail about what was happening, but Vildasi could guess. The most likely possibility was that the council felons had somehow broken from their containment yards and were running rampant in the facility. She snuck a look back at the humans. Adam was beginning to pace up and down in front of the glass, whilst Carlos stood still as a statue. Two sets of eyes were fixed unwaveringly on her. She suppressed a shudder. She loved Adam and was grateful for everything he had done for her, and his acceptance of Carlos had warmed Vildasi to the boy soldier to a degree, 
but she would never step inside that yard with those two the way they were now. She didn't know enough about humans to be sure of her own safety. It's like they could feel the severity of the situation through their skin, and were reacting in a manner that frightened her. At this exact moment, Vildasi couldn't be sure whether she'd be safer in here with two alert and dangerous human warriors, or out there amongst a rampaging pack of violent felons. Locking eyes with Adam, Vildasi initiated the lockdown procedures for their yard, effectively sealing herself in her own tiny pocket of security. Both humans saw this, and Adam immediately started beating at the glass, screaming for her to open the door. Vildasi, Vildasi, I can't protect you. I can't protect you. Open the door. I can't reach. She shut off the sound feed into the human yard, unable to bear the sound of Adam's voice. All he wanted to do was protect her, but she just didn't trust that he would be able to keep himself from hurting her in the process. The bare truth was that Adam was an unstable killing machine, created for a war that surpassed anything she could ever even dream of understanding. Carlos was no better. It was best that those two were kept separate from the wider prison populace, currently rioting, until security personnel brought things under control. They were like fuel for the fire. Adam continued to beat at the glass in eerie silence, his face stretching and contorting with each shrieked vowel. He had based so much of his existence on protecting her. What meager stability he had, he had built it with her safety as a foundation. This was the best way to keep him sane. Behind Adam, Carlos strode up and placed a hand on his shoulder. She didn't know what he was saying, but it calmed Adam enough for him to continue pacing, rather than beat his fists bloody on the glass. It's okay, Adam. Carlos whispered soothingly. It's okay, buddy. You see those doors? She'll be fine. She's safer in there than anywhere else. It's okay. Adam could hear him whisper rumble in his ear. Carlos was a good boy. A good friend. A good user helper. Adam trusted him more than he had many others. They knew the same things. They had felt the same way. They were little broken blades. Ugh. Okay. Carlos. Okay. Adam agreed, taking deep shuddering breaths. He'd nearly lost control, like when the chitterbugs had hurt her. Nothing could hurt her no more, not as long as Adam was around. He could still feel the tightness in his body. He was all wound up like a spring. The hate wolf old Adam was gnawing at the steel bars inside his heart, and it wouldn't be long before it got out. He had to be calm, as calm can be, calmer than still waters. If he didn't, the hate would seep out and hurt everyone. He had to keep it all down. He had to be the new Adam. The Adam that people could trust. Adam started to pace back and forth, still a-staring through the glass at Vildasi. He'd protect her no matter what. She was his first and best friend, his best user helper. The thing that fought back the hate wolf old Adam. He'd protect her no matter what, and everything would be okay. Everything would be okay. Vildasi could see the felons milling about outside the doors on the vid feeds that fed directly to the observation deck. It's like they were waiting for something. Rampaging felons should never seem this calm. Vildasi began to feel the tendrils of unease begin to creep their way into her heart. Why were they so calm? What were they waiting for? Everyone, please listen to me. The voice over the PA system was mirrored by her PC. The voice was no longer robotic and sterile but panicked, pained, and decidedly alive. Listen, barricade yourselves in. The security systems are about to fail. They've got a way into command. We don't have much tie. Great Skylord, they're in. Save your... The transmission was suddenly cut off. Vildasi immediately moved to open up the security door into the human yard. The situation had changed. She would need them if she was to have any chance of survival. She could see from their reactions that they had realized that something terrible was happening, and they were already moving to the door. Carlos with brutal efficiency and Adam with desperate ferocity. Everything began to happen at once. As Vildasi took her first step, the security door behind her hissed open and countless races began to pour in. It was too late. Vildasi's hand was descending towards the controls even as a stolen vibroblade no doubt taken from a poor fallen security officer, descended towards her back in the hands of a screaming shrieker. It slashed her back, severing her spinal cord and spewing a great deal of blue blood onto the floor. Her legs, suddenly bereft of strength, flopped lifelessly beneath her. Vildasi crumpled forward, her body striking the button allowing access to the human yard. 
the last thing she would ever see was Adam's screaming face as pain and madness took hold. She had failed him. She was supposed to stay safe. Everything was going to be okay. The door was open and Adam was screaming. These two facts were very clear to Carlos. Adam was screaming a scream that Adam had heard only once before. He had heard it on the bridge of the planet cracker, as he lay gasping for breath in a pool of his own blood. And Terry went about his desperate last stand. It was a piercing howl lamenting the loss of a friend. It was a raging cry against fate. At this moment, Carlos knew that he could not stop Adam. Adam would kill him as surely as he was about to kill himself. The Xenos flooded in, no doubt eager to claim the heads of two hated humans. Carlos hung back a moment, uncertain of how he was going to survive. There were dozens of them. Adam had no such compunction, but instead charged in with all the fury of a berserking Pyrian. He moved in a way that Carlos had never seen. It was ferocious and terribly beautiful, and horrifyingly graceful. It was a dance of blood and gore as Adam sidestepped and twirled, contorting himself into impossible shapes to avoid strikes and blows as he somehow intuitively knew when a Xeno was going to stab, slash, or shoot. Aware of what was behind him and below him at all times, Adam killed with gay abandon, crying and laughing at the same time as he snapped and pulverized, slashed and disemboweled, twisted and ripped. Carlos fought with a mechanical utility that was ugly in comparison. He had quickly secured a rifle and was firing into the mob. They were unorganized, clearly without any military training, and were unable to get out of range of Adam's mad twirling. Carlos, safe from any shots fired at him due to the simple fact that anyone who took their eyes off Adam died shortly after, covered the madman with precisely placed bullets. Heedless of all but his dirty work, Adam spilled countless lives onto the garden and mashed them into the dirt, watering the leafy plants with their blood. Shi Lin. Fifty-seven days after Androm's folly. Delegate Arcutus Chambers. Andoran Space. She Lin looked down at the cuffs that bound her wrist and flexed them experimentally. She was flanked by two imposing Pyrian guards and sat opposite Delegate Arcudu. The old Andoran, while still young by her standards, regarded her with piercing black eyes framed by pale blue skin. Even now, she felt a flutter of pride in what he was. A creation of humanity. A child of humanity, transcendent. But right now she had to maintain the strong facade she had built. It would not do for the children to turn on their mother. You wanted something, Delegate Arkutu? Yes. Can you tell me what is happening here? He pressed a button on his console and a video filled the main screen behind him. It was a vision of bloodshed and battle that Shi Lin had not seen for a long time. Two human warriors tore countless Xenos apart in what looked to be some kind of underground arena. This could not be true. That something like that had survived for all this time. Where did you get him? She breathed. We captured the one with the rifle from Battle Station, Lost Brother, after your failed push through our Amzi. He was the only live human to be taken from that battle. The one twirling about in the middle there. He's not twirling. He's dancing. I had no idea that any of the Alfrenhar had survived the calamity. This is amazing. There was a moment of silence as Arkutu regarded Shilin with steady eyes. So, this Alfrenhar, is he an unusual human? Yes. Very much so. Is this video current? You have to send people in to subdue him. Otherwise, he will kill himself and everyone in that room. Shi Lin said quickly. I'll do no such thing until I have a grasp of the situation. Good God, we don't have much time. Shi Lin cried out, unable to contain herself at the prospect of a live Ulfrand Har. Then, explain quickly. Arkutu said testily. Shi Lin opened her mouth to argue, but realized it was a waste of breath. She would give him enough to force him to act. Surely she would have enough time to do that. The old friend Har were created by humanity transcendent during the calamity, in the hopes of creating a super soldier capable of roundly defeating the taint. They are far stronger, faster, and more ferocious than anything I have ever encountered. However, the gene therapy required to create something like this resulted in some mental side effects that could not be avoided. Such as? Arcutu prompted. Simply put, they're completely psychotic. More often than not, they have no concept of what is reality and what is not. 
Many of the preliminary subjects were no more than rabbit animals. However, most of the later subjects were forced to develop dual personalities in order to maintain a modicum of their capability to reason. In order for this to happen, most Ulfrenhar bonded to someone who would act as their anchor, or a lodestone if you will. This person would keep the Ulfrenhar emotionally and psychologically stable for the most part. It is a very important relationship, and generally involved strong feelings for both parties. We typically called them handlers. So, what is happening here? This Ulfrenhar is engaging in what we called a final farewell. He has lost the anchor that holds him to reality. If we do not calm him and allow him to bond with another soon, we will lose a very valuable resource in the fight against Winchester. Arcutu tapped at his desk for a moment before keying into some sort of calm system. This is Delegate Arcutu. Gas them. On no account are the humans to be harmed. May I see them? Shi Lin asked, keeping her face neutral. Perhaps. Arcutu replied. Kill them. Kill them. Kill them. Kill them all. They took Vildasi away. They took his Vildasi. His best user helper. She was so kind. So kind. And they were not. He would show them just how unkind he could be. He would show them the monster slasher killer slaughter that would haunt their ghosts. He would tear their memories from them and eat them. He would find their husbands, wives, daughters, sons, and slit their gullet throats. They did not know. They did not understand. But they did not need to. All they had to do was sleep, scream, die, and then so would he. The wrath-hate wolf raged while gentleness cowered within. There weren't many left now, but the ones still alive were swift, canny, and skilled. Much of Adam's fluidity and grace had been leached away, leaving his movements just not quite quick enough, not quite dexterous enough, to catch the Xenos that yet lived. Carlos could clearly see that he was tired. Every now and then he would see Adam wobble a little or stumble over a body sprawled on the ground. Numerous cuts and wounds decorated his flesh, leaking scarlet rivulets of blood onto the floor. He was slowing, and his raging screams were now despairing moans. Carlos couldn't bear to watch. Adam was all he had left. He was his only friend. A Pyrian managed to club Adam down with his rifle. Adam surged back to his feet and snapped the furred giant's neck, before catching another flying knee to the head from a Karak felon. He tumbled over again, crying out in pain this time. Carlos charged forward, firing accurately from his shoulder and shredding the Karak with hyper-accelerated bullets as he did so. There were only four left now, and they did not seem ready to leap to their deaths as so many of their comrades had. Carlos stood over Adam with his weapon raised. Another fucking step closer and you die. We're done, you hear? We're done. The felons all looked at each other and seemed to nod in agreement. They lowered their weapons before backing away. Carlos waited for them to exit before kneeling down with Adam. You let the Vildasi takers go. Adam snarled at Carlos. You let them go. He clutched at Carlos' neck in an attempt to choke him but was too weak and Carlos easily brushed it aside. Why? Why did you let them go? I needed to kill them and tear them up and break their backs. Adam choked out. That ain't you, Adam. Carlos whispered. That ain't you. Gas began to hiss from the ceiling in a hazy fog as Carlos cradled Adam's head. Adam seemed to drift off to sleep as Carlos held him, and Carlos quickly checked his vitals. They were weak but stable. Obviously, the gas was some kind of tranquilizer designed to deal with situations like this. But why hadn't they used it sooner? If they had the ability to do this, why hadn't they done it as soon as the felons had broken out? It seemed to be such a needless waste of life. To test us. Carlos shook his head in derision. Bastards were always playing games with his life, always. Adam shifted in his arms again, and breathed a little easier, his cuts and abrasions staining Carlos' skin with blood that quickly dried to a rusty brown. I'm here for you, bud. 